Hello and welcome to this edition of Exeter Explains. I'm Dr. Steve Gandhi and today I'm going to talk to you about the effects of common cores on redundant systems and how that can impact your overall PFD average for the system. So first and foremost, what is common cores all about? So common cores is a phenomenon that can affect redundant systems. And usually with redundant systems, they're the same manufacturer's devices. There's just two of them or three of them, however many we have. So what happens is that if we have external stresses, such as excessive heat vibration, RFI, humidity, so on, this can affect the redundant systems in similar ways. And therefore, we have to take that into consideration when we're doing our calculations for our PFD average. Combinations of these stresses can be quite significant. But there can be other things as well. For example, a software bug. If we have the same controllers from the same manufacturer that have the same firmware or software, then that is an example of a, where a common cause, if there's a bug, could affect both systems. There's another extreme. There was actually a case where a forklift driver was, was running through the, the part of the plant where they had conduit overhead and he had his fork up too high and hadn't realized and he actually took out the conduit. Well, unfortunately for the plant, that they had both sets of redundant cables for their systems running through the same conduit. So in one fell swoop, he took out the whole redundant system. So that's an extreme example of, of common cause and how that could impact the system. So if we think of it this way, let's say that based upon our failure rates and so forth for a, a one out of two system or a redundant system, and we were expecting to have a false trip rate of 0 0.001 per year, but actually it's coming out to be 0 0.006 per year. And then, of course, well, why is that? And that's because there could be contribution due to common cause. And this could also come down to potential systematic issues with the competency of the people that we have doing the maintenance or the procedures. So if the person isn't properly trained or the pre procedure is incorrect, then they can inadvertently cause a, a common cause by either miscalibrating or missetting the trip points such that instead of it being set to the proper level, it's set too low so we get more trips. And hence our spurious trip could be higher than we anticipated. So this is why we have to take into consideration the potential for common cause. So common cause, there's a model that's expressed as being the beta model. And because in functional safety engineering and reliability engineering, we like Greek symbols so much, we define our failure rate as lambda, and we define our common cause factor, or our beta factor, using the Greek symbol beta. And simply put, beta is the ratio of the common cause part of the failure rate to the overall failure rate. So now, when we look at our failure rate, we can split it into the independent portion and the common cause portion. But again, this is only for redundant systems, not for single element systems. And therefore, our common cause failure rate will simply be the product of the failure rate lambda times beta. And beta represents a fraction. It's between 0 and 1, or 0 to 100%. And this basically tells us where two or more failures can occur because of a common cause. So we have to consider that when we're doing our PFD calculations, doing our SIL verification, for example, if we have redundant sensors or if we have redundant final elements or even redundant logic solvers. So where do we get the number from? Well, NASA determined that for the shuttle, they would use 11%. In IEC 615.08, it defines beta as being anywhere between half a percent to 5% for programmable electronic equipment and between 1% to 10% for the field equipment. 
So this is where we can get the numbers. And any of you using Excellentia will probably know that we default to 10% on the conservative side, of course. Not horrendously conservative, but just on the conservative side. So we use that as the starting point. So think of it this way. If our lambda is 0.02 failures per year, our beta is 5%, then our lambda common cause, or lambda CC, will be simply lambda beta, which would be 0.001 failures per year. And therefore, to calculate the independent portion, we would use our complement rule. So we would say 1 minus beta times lambda gives us our independent portion which would be 0 0.019. Now, if we've done our math correctly, when we add the independent and the common cause back together, the failure rates, we should get to our original failure rate. So if we add 0.001 to 0 0.019, of course, we get back to 0 0.02. So that's a way of just doing a sanity check to see have we calculated our independent portion correctly. If we think of it from a fault tree perspective, we can see that on the left side, we have the fault tree without the common cause. And we have two power supplies, and we can say that our top event will be both power supplies failing for the system to fail. So of course, power supply A and power supply B have to fail. So you can hear the logic, and. In the second case, on the right-hand side, now we're considering common cause because the failure of the power supply system could be because power supply A and power supply B fail or because of the common cause. So now you can hear the logic again, and, or. So we always bring the common cause in at the end through an or gate because we can say that the power supply system can fail because the individual power supplies fail or because a common cause shorts them both out. So this is how we treat it in a fault tree. And it's a good way to think about it because you can hear the logic as you say it. So let's, using our numbers that we had before, let's consider an example. Now, to keep things simple, we're going to assume perfect proof testing. Now, perfect proof testing means that our coverage is 100% because we can find and fix everything which of course is just not the case. But in order to keep the math simple for this example where we're just doing the comparisons to see what's the impact without common cause and what's the impact with common cause being considered. There'll be another video that goes into this in a bit more detail. So let's use our same numbers as we had before. Let's say our lambda is 0.02 failures per year. We're using our 5%. And now we're going to say our test interval is once a year. So those are the, the variables we've got. We know from before that our lambda common cause is simply going to be our lambda beta, which will come out to be, again, using because we're using the same numbers, the 0 0.001. And that our independent will be 1 minus beta times lambda, which gives us 0 0.019. So those are the independent and common cause parts. So going back to our left-hand side with our fault tree ignoring common cause, we know that to calculate the PFD average, it's going to be lambda d squared t squared over 3. And as I say, in a separate video, I'll go into a, a little more detail as to how we get to this point. <clears throat> so if we plug in our numbers, we end up with a PFD average of 0 0.00133. So what is that in risk reduction? Well, risk reduction factor is 1 over the PFD average. So if we divide this into 1, we simply get a risk reduction factor of 7,500, which would tend to indicate that this can achieve a fairly high SIL3. Now again, because we're not considering imperfect proof testing, these numbers are going to be much higher than they would otherwise be. But for comparison purposes, that's fine. So let's come back to the right-hand side now. And again, for the AND part of it, it's going to be 
lambda d squared t squared over 3, but now we have to add in the PFD average for the common cause, which will be lambda cc t over 2. Now if we plug in our numbers and do the math, we end up with a PFD average of nearly six times more than we had before, which means our risk reduction factor is almost six times less. So you can see, and this is using a 5% beta. If we were to use 10%, the gap would be even wider. So that's why we cannot ignore common cause. If you choose to ignore common cause in your SIF design, where you've got redundant elements, then again, all you're doing is fooling yourself into thinking that you're going to get a much more reliable system than you actually have. So we do need to consider common cause. The standard also requires us to document reasons for not including common cause if we have a redundant system. Now, what can we do in terms of some protection against common cause? Well, of course, we can use physical separation. We can put redundant units into different cabinets and even different areas, and we can run the cabling in independent different conduits. So, of course, they won't see as much of the common cause potential, and therefore that will help with reducing the impact. Another way is to use diverse technology. As I said, typically, when we have redundant units, it's the same manufacturer's devices, just either two of them or three of them. And in this case, we would say, well, we'll use different manufacturer's devices or we'll use different sensing technologies. Because again, they will have the, the difference which will be less susceptible to some types of common cause. However, we have to bear in mind that now if we're going to do that, we've got two different sets of spares for the same thing, effectively. And therefore, if they're different manufacturers, the maintenance guys need to know that, they need to know the differences between the two, and they need to know where they need to be installed. And of course, that has an impact on maintenance. So at the same time as being able to reduce our common cause to a certain degree, we've now pushed up our maintenance costs. So we'd have to look and see, well, does the reduction in the common cause and the improvement in the PFD average offset the additional cost and potential for systematic with using diverse technology in different manufacturers' devices. But again, that's a decision that can be made, quite simply. As I mentioned, Excellencia, automatically, if you put in a, say, for example, a redundant configuration, it will pop up with the beta factor set to 10%. And as you can see from some of these headings here, within these headings, we can go and check boxes to say, yes, we're using diversification. Yes, we've got separate systems in separate boxes and so on and so forth. And there are some systematic aspects about the, the uh, maintenance people are properly trained, regularly trained, and so on. And if we check, check all the boxes that are in there, we can get down to 2%. But again, that reduction down to 2% and the improvement in the PFD average, does it offset the additional costs that we're incurring elsewhere? And that's the thing with the life cycle. We can, it, we can balance it out. We can make informed decisions. So I hope you found this interesting, this short video. Please stay in touch with us through our social media channels. And if you have any specific questions regarding this particular video, my email's there please drop me a line and we look forward to you attending another one of these.